Dear students and viewers, you are most welcome to this discussion on the valuation of long term securities. This topic is related to the lecture module 6 and 7 of your financial management course. This is the second program of this course. In the first program, I have discussed about time value of money. You should have very clear understanding about time value of money for better understanding of this topic. In this discussion, I am going to focus on the topics like value concepts, investment decisions, valuation of bonds, preferred stock valuation, common stock valuation. At first, you should have very clear idea about value concept. The term value has different meanings to different people. We can start our discussion with the comparison between liquidation value and going concern value. Let us see, liquidation value is the amount of money that could be realized if the asset of a firm is sold separately from its operating organization. Going concern value of a firm is the amount the firm could be sold for as a continuing operating business. It is rare that liquidation value and going concern value are equal. In security valuation models, we are generally dealing with going concern value because going concern value is related to the continuing operating business and only operating firm can generate positive cash flows to the investors. Now, we are going to see the comparison between book value and market value. Book value of an asset is the accounting value of the asset which can be calculated as assets cost minus its accumulated depreciation. On the other hand, book value of a firm, it is the firm's total assets minus liabilities and preferred stock as listed on its balance sheet. Now, in case of market value of an asset, it is the market price at which the asset or a similar asset is being traded in an open marketplace and market value for a firm it is often viewed as being the higher of the firm's liquidation value or going concern value. You see that in case of market value for any firm you should know the liquidation value and going concern value and you have to take the higher one. Now we can make another between market value and intrinsic value. Basically, these two values are very important for investment decisions. Market value of a security is the market price of the security. On the other hand, intrinsic value of a security is what the price of a security should, should be if properly priced. Here, valuation is based on all factors like assets, earning, future prospects, management and so on. In short, we can say that the intrinsic value of a security is its economic value. In taking decision to invest in securities, you should know the market value of the security and the intrinsic value of the security. Generally, there are three basic rules of decisions. We can see these three rules here. In case of decision rule 1, if the intrinsic value is greater than the market value, then the decision will be purchasing the security. In case of decision rule 2, if the intrinsic value is less than the market value, then the decision will be not purchasing the security. And in case of decision rule 3, if the intrinsic value is equal to the market value, then it will, it will be indifferent in purchasing the security. You see that you should know the market value and intrinsic value of the security. You can know the market value of the security because this is the market price. You can go to the stock exchange and you can get the market value of the security. But 
you have to calculate the intrinsic value. In case of calculation of intrinsic value, basically you have to discount the future cash flows that can be generated from that particular security over the life of that particular security. So, what are those security? We are talking about long term securities that means bond, preferred stock or common stock. We can start our discussion with bond. A bond is the security that pays a stated amount of interest to the investor period after period until it is finally retired by the issuing company. Bonds has three features like bond has a face value generally it is taka 1000, bond has a stated coupon rate or interest rate and bonds may have maturity that means bonds may mature or it may not mature. In case of bond, there are three types of cash flows. At first, when you buy the bond, there will be cash outflow. Then, if you receive interest, that will be cash inflow. And on maturity, if you get back your face value of the bond, that will be another cash inflow. Now, you have to calculate the present value of the cash inflows to determine the intrinsic value of the bond. To determine the present value of the future cash inflows, as you have learned from time value of money program that you should know the discounting rate. Generally, discounting rate composed of risk free rate of return and the premium for risk. There are different types of bond. At first, we can learn about perpetual bond. Perpetual bond is a unique class of bond that will never mature. There is an infinite stream of interest payments. So, the formula will be like that where I is equal to annual coupon payments and K D is the investors required rate of return or the discounting rate. Here cash flow is for interim period. So, it will be infinite and the formula can be reduced to a simple form like I divided by K D. Now, for example, a perpetual bond with face value of taka 1000 pays 12 percent coupon forever and the investors required rate of return for this bond is 15 percent. In the example, you can see that the coupon is face value into coupon rate that is taka 120 and the KD that means required return of the investor is 15 percent or 0.15. The value of perpetual bond can be calculated by the equation I that means coupon divided by K D that means required rate of return. Coupon was taka 120, K D was 0.15 or 15 percent. So, the value of the perpetual bond will be taka 800. In case of perpetual bond, you see that that bond will never mature, you will always get the interest forever. But there are other types of bond that will ma mature in future. So, that type of bond is called bonds with finite maturity. There are two types of bond that will mature in future. One is non-zero coupon bond and another one is zero coupon bond. In case of non-zero coupon bond, you will get interest and finally, when it will mature, you will get the face value. So, we can see in what way we can calculate the intrinsic value of non-zero coupon bond. If a bond has a finite maturity, then we must consider not only the interest stream, but also the terminal or maturity value or phase value in valuing that bond. And in that case, the valuation model will be like this one, where the formula will be I divided by 1 plus kg to the power n 1 and it will continue up to n, because up to n you will get interest here and when the bond will mature, you will get the maturity value. But the first part you can recognize that this is annuity because you will get i i i at regular interval. So, we can calculate the present value by using present value interest factor of annuity with k d and n period. And when the bond will mature, you will get the phase value or maturity value m v and this you will get at the end of n period. So, this is the this is the lump sum amount to be received after n period. 
in this case to calculate the present value of this amount we are going to use present value of interest factor with k d and n. Now, for example, if a taka 1000 per value bond with a 10 percent coupon will mature after 9 years then the required rate of return of the investor for this bond is 12 percent then we can calculate the annual coupon payment that is the face value and coupon rate that is taka 100 and investors required rate of return is 12 percent. So, it will be 0 0.12. If we can put this value in the formula in the model then we will find that the interest is 100 and interest rate could required rate of return is 1 2. So, it is 1.12 to the power 1 and it will continue up to 9 year because the bond will mature in 9 years time and at the end of 9 year the maturity value or phase value you will get here and it will be divided by 1.12 to the power 9. So, in the table you will find the value of present value interest factor this is the interest and present value interest factor for 12 percent and 9 period and in the table you will find the value that is 5.328 and in case of maturity value you are going to use present value interest factor for 12 percent and 9 period in the table you will find the value that will be 0 0.361 and finally, the result will be taka 893.80. In the last example you see that the coupon rate of the bond was 10 percent and the discounting rate or required rate of return of the investor was 12 percent that means, required rate of return was higher than the coupon rate. What will happen if the required rate of return is lower than the coupon rate that means, if we take required rate of return as 8 percent then what will be the intrinsic value of the bond. Let us see here I am using the same example of a taka 1000 par value bond with 10 percent coupon that will mature after 9 years. The required rate of return of the investor for this bond is 8 percent you can see the change here previously it was 12 percent now I change it is 8 percent. Now, we can use the same formula for calculating the value where I is the annual coupon payment and K D is the investors required rate of return. As the face value of the bond is taka 1000 and coupon was 10 percent. So, the annual coupon payment will be taka 100 and required rate of return will be 8 percent or 0 0.08. Now, in the formula we can put this value where I is equal to 100 and K D is equal to 0 0.08. So, it will be 1 plus k d that means 1.08 and it will continue up to 9 year because the bond will mature in the 9th year and at the end of 9 year we will get the face value 1000 and to get the present value we have to divide it by 1.08 to the power 9. Now, in the formula we have to use present value interest factor of annuity for the interest receives and here interest is taka 100 and present value of interest factor of annuity at 8 percent for 9 period it will be 6.247 and in case of the phase value on maturity that is taka 1000 we have to use present value interest factor for lump sum amount at 8 percent and 9 period and from the table you get the value that will be 0 0.500 and in this way you can calculate the intrinsic value of the bond with finite maturity that is taka 1124.7. 1, Did you remark the relationship between required rate of return and the intrinsic value of the bond? In the last two examples we have calculated the intrinsic value of the bond by taking required rate of return 12 percent and 8 percent. Now, we can see the relationship of the bond price when we are changing the required rate of return. Let us see here I am explaining the relationship between required rate of return and bonds value. In the in case of a taka 1000 par value bond with a 10 percent coupon that will mature after 9 years if the required rate of return k d 12 percent is higher than the coupon rate i 10 percent then we have calculated that the intrinsic value taka 893.8 is lower than the face value of taka 1000. That means, if k d is greater than i then intrinsic value is lower than the face value. On the other hand if required rate of return 
K D 8 percent is lower than the coupon rate I 10 percent. Then we have calculated that intrinsic value is taka 1124.7 that is higher than the face value taka 1000. So, here K D is smaller than I. So, intrinsic value is greater than face value taka 1000. But if the K D that means required rate of return is equal to the coupon rate I then you will find that the intrinsic value will be equal to the face value of taka 1000. Now, I will discuss about zero coupon bond. In case of zero coupon bond, you will purchase the bond at a price that is lower than the face value of the bond and there will be no interest income in case of zero coupon bond. When the bond will mature, you will get back the face value of the bond. So, the difference of outflow and inflow is the return to you. So, we can calculate the intrinsic value of zero coupon, zero coupon bond here. You can see a zero coupon bond makes no periodic interest payments, but instead is sold at a deep discount from its face value. Now, think of a 10 year zero coupon bond. So, at the initial stage you have to buy at a price lower than its face value and you will get no interest because it is zero, zero coupon bond and when the bond will mature after 10 years you will receive the face value at maturity. Now, for example, if a company issues a zero coupon bond at taka 300 having a 10 year maturity and a taka 1000 face value investors required return is 12 percent then we can calculate the value of this zero coupon bond. Here at the beginning you have to pay taka 300 that is this is outflow and when the bond will mature after 10 years you will get taka 1000. Now, you have to calculate the present value of this taka 1000 and you know this is the lump sum amount to be received after 10 years. So, you can use this formula that is future value into 1 by 1 plus k d to the power n and you know this is lump sum amount. So, you can use the present value interest factor at k d for n period and we can put the value here because future value 1000 1 by 1 plus 0 0.12 this is the required rate of return and this is the maturity period that is 10 year and by converting this one or you can value this uh, 3.322 from the present value interest factor table and the value of the bond will be taka 322 and look at this the bond can be purchased at taka 300 but the intrinsic value is taka 322 so it is better to buy this particular bond so far i have discussed about the bonds that are paying interest annually but in most of the cases you can see that bonds are paying interest semi annually that means after 6 months you will get some interest and again after 6 months you will get another sum of interest. In that case what should be the formula that we can use for calculating the intrinsic value of that particular bond. You know that in case of time value of money the timing of cash receipts is very important and in this case you are getting interest two times in a year rather than once at the end of the year. Let us see what will be the change in the formula in this particular case. Semi annual compounding of interest. Most bond pay interest semi annually that means twice in a year. In that case the formula will be changed like this one where I will be divided by 2 that means coupon will be divided by 2 and also the required rate of return k d should be divided by 2 in all the cases of the formula. You can see and this particular formula can be reduced in this form that is sum of i by 2 divided by 1 plus k d by 2 to the power t where t is 1 to 2 n and the future value that means maturity value divided by 1 plus k d by 2 to the power 2 n and you know that this is the future uh, present value interest factor. So, you can use this one for maturity value and for the annuity you can use present value interest factor of annuity with k d by 2 and 2 n. And for example, a 10 percent bond of taka 1000 par value will pay semi annual interest here 
the bond will mature after 12 years and required rate of return is 14 percent. So, in this case 14 percent that means k d divided by 2 we have to use 7 percent and 2 n that means n is 12. So, we have to use 2 into 12 that is 24 just you can see here i or coupon is equal to 1000 plus 10 percent taka 100 and k d is equal to 14 percent or 0.14 and in the formula we can see that is coupon 100 divided by 2 and present value interest factor of annuity for 7 percent that means half of 14 percent and 2 n means 24 period here also 7 percent and 24 period. So, you can find the value of present value interest factor of NUT and present value interest factor of lump sum from the table and the value can be put in the equation and you will find that the value of the bond will be taka 770.45. Now, if I put the value of present value interest factor of NUT and present value interest factor for lump sum amount from the table, then we can find this the interest will be i by 2 is equal to 50 and present value interest factor of annuity will be 11.469 and present value of lump sum amount that is 0 0.197 and the value of the bond will be taka 770.45. So, far I have discussed about different types of bonds. Now, I will discuss about preferred stock preferred stock is very rare nowadays. In case of preferred stock, you will get a stated amount of dividend at regular intervals and generally preferred stocks will never mature. So, you will get a stated amount of dividend regularly and it will be similar to perpetuity. The formula to calculate the intrinsic value of perpetual bond can be used here. Let us see in what way we can calculate the intrinsic value of preferred stock. Most preferred stock pays a fixed dividend at regular intervals and it has no stated mature due date. Therefore, preferred stock is similar to a perpetual bond. So, we can use the same formula value of preferred stock is equal to dividend that means annual stated dividend per share divided by the investors required rate of return for preferred stock. Now, for example, if a company has a 9 percent dividend paying taka 100 per value preferred stock and the investors required return is 14 percent on this investment, then we can calculate the intrinsic value of this preferred stock by using the formula where dividend per share of the preferred stock is phase value into dividend rate that is taka 9 and investors required rate of return is 14 percent or 0.14. Now, in the formula we can put the value here that is dividend per share 9 and required rate of return 0.14 and the value of the preferred stock will be taka 64.29. Now, I will discuss about the valuation of common stock. Basically, common stockholders are the owner of the organizations. In case of bond and preferred stock, you are certain about the future cash inflows, but in case of common stock, there will be no certainty that what amount you will receive in future, because there is no obligation for the company to pay dividend at regular interval to the stockholders. There are different methods to calculate the value of common stock. If we can make some assumptions about the future cash inflows through dividend of the common stock, then we can use dividend discount model here. If we take one assumption that in future company will pay dividend that will grow at a constant rate, then we can use constant growth rate model here to calculate the intrinsic value of common stock. Let us see one example here. In common stock valuation, we are using dividend discount model here with the assumption that there will be constant growth that means, dividends are expected to grow at a constant rate g and the equation of the present value for common stock would be value of common stock is equal to d 0 that means, dividend at now 
into 1 plus g, g is the growth rate divided by 1 plus k e, k e is the expected rate of return for the equity or common stock holder and it will continue forever because it will not mature. The formula can be reduced in simple form where it will be value of common stock is equal to d 0 into 1 plus g and you know d 0 into 1 plus g that means dividend after 1 year d 1 and in the denominator it will be expected rate of return of the common stockholder that is ke minus g that means growth rate. So, we can we can explain this in example like a company's d0 is stuck a 4 per share and that the dividend is expected to grow at 6 percent forever. Then d1 will be d0 into 1 plus g that means 4 into 1.06 it will be 4.24 and suppose the appropriate discount rate that means expected rate of return of the common stock holders that is 14 percent. We can put the value in the equation here and it will be 4.24 that is the d1 4.24 and expected rate of return of the common stockholders 0.14 and the growth rate g that is 0 0.06 and we can find the value of the common stock here that is taka 53. You see the critical assumption of this valuation model is that the future dividend per share is expected to grow perpetually at compound rate of g. This particular assumption is fairly true in many organizations. Dear students, in this particular discussion already I have discussed about the value concept, about investment decisions and the valuation of bonds, preferred stock and common stock. I think this discussion will help you to learn this particular topic while reading your course materials. So, read the course materials very carefully, there are many problems and you have to practice a lot. Thank you and see you.